Hi, I'm Gopal Yadavali. I'm the program director here at BMC. Thanks for um, watching this video. Please check out all of our videos um, so you can be really prepared for interview day when you come. I want to first summarize our program. This is how I think of us, hopefully this is how you'll think of us by the time you're done with us today, but we are a large university-based internal medicine residency program in a research-intensive department of medicine. We have a strong sense of social mission that you hear about all day uh, when you're with us. We're affiliated with our major VA, and we have a strong sense of resident autonomy and engagement. Each of these things are things that I hope you encounter a lot in your travels uh, with interviews this season, but to have all of them in one place, I think makes us special, and I think it's very unusual. So again, that's how I think of us. I hope that that's how you think of us by the time you're done with us today. I'd like to now read a quote to you from our Vice President of Mission, uh, Dr. Thea James. The quote is, we're a safety net hospital, but a very unique one. One with resources and always leading with nuanced ideas. Never afraid to do what is unusual and never afraid to do what has not been done before. The message itself is terrific, but I think what's even more uh, amazing is that we have a Vice President of Mission, and hopefully that conveys to you how important that is, not just in our program or in our department, but at the medical center level. So let me begin with a little bit of history. So the origins of the medical school are actually in the New England Female Medical College. This is the first medical college for women in the country, one of the first of its kind worldwide. It was eventually subsumed in the 19th century by Boston University, reopened as Boston University School of Medicine, the first co-educational school of medicine in the United States, and the first to graduate an African-American female physician, shown here, Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler. It was also one of the first to graduate a Native American physician. So you hear a lot about diversity here. In my mind, this is where the diversity on this campus begins. Diversity continues to be a priority for us. Yeah, we define it in many, many ways. One of the ways I show you here is in racial and ethnic diversity. So the graph that I'm showing you is from our GME office. And this represents all residents and fellows here at Boston Medical Center, specifically um, showing you people who come from a background that is traditionally underrepresented in medicine. And what you see is we have a steady increase in people from URIM backgrounds. And the blue bars show you that in this past year, we were up to 29% of our incoming interns identified as being from groups underrepresented in medicine. So this continues to be a major emphasis for us. Our sense of mission comes from this institution, which is Boston City Hospital. So the story of Boston City Hospital is, about 1864 or so, there was a cholera epidemic raging through the south end of Boston, which is where we're located. Back then, as is the case today, people who were least able to afford medical care were the ones getting the cholera, and they were turned away from every other hospital in town back then. The only place anyone would take care of them were in tents that were set up here along Harrison Avenue. Most of these patients went into those tents and died. So at that point, the people who ran the city decided there needed to be a hospital for the people of Boston, regardless of their ability to pay. And that led, in 1864, to the opening of Boston City Hospital, the People's Hospital, by most accounts, the first municipal hospital in the country. Now, even though we're called Boston Medical Center and not Boston City Hospital, that sense of mission is still what brings many of us here and what keeps many of us here. Another part of our history is from Boston University Hospital. So what I'm showing you here is a hospital called Massachusetts Memorial Hospital. I'll talk about that again when I mention the Evans family. But Mass Memorial in the early 20th century was replaced by Boston University Hospital. And in 1996, the University Hospital merged with the City Hospital to form Boston Medical Center. This is what allows us to see the whole spectrum of society. We have our large urban underserved population from our city hospital roots, and then everyone else from the university hospital side. As one of our emeritus faculty was fond of saying, come to see patients here at BMC and in the waiting room, you'll see bank presidents sitting next to people experiencing homelessness. And we take great pride in taking care of those folks and everyone who comes here at a very high level. Also in this picture, you see um, what is called the Talbot Building. This is a more modern rendition of that building. It is now 
the School of Public Health, which is actually right behind me in that direction. If you look out the window of my office, this is the view that you see with the quad and the Talbot building. I show you this uh, to show you that not only are we physically close to the School of Public Health, but to tell you that we're also philosophically very close. Many of our faculty were trained there, many have secondary appointments hit there. One of the things that close to my heart is global health. And the global health that's not done in the medical school is done in the School of Public Health. We take every opportunity we have to, for our residents to interact with the students and faculty in the School of Public Health. And this is why we're able to have a great emphasis on population health in our program. Now, a little bit more about our department. So, we are the Evans Department of Medicine. I'm in the Evans building right now. The Evans Seminar Room is around the corner. We have Evans, Evans educators, Evans scholars. So, who's Evans and why is everything named for him? Well, Evans is this man, Robert Dawson Evans. He was a rubber industrialist of the late 19th century, very successful. So successful, in fact, and so well connected that by the turn of that century in 1909, he was in a position to host President Taft and his family at the Evans Estate, which is about 20 miles north of here. So in preparation for that visit, one day he got on his horse and went about his grounds, as I often do on the weekends, but he had an equestrian accident. He was thrown from his horse, suffered massive internal injuries, was put on a horse-drawn carriage and brought 20 miles south and admitted to Massachusetts Memorial Hospital to, with bleeding and hemorrhage to our department, the Department of Medicine. And naturally, we gave him state-of-the-art care, which in 1909 included champagne enemas and intravenous brandy. And despite those interventions, he hemorrhaged and died within 72 hours of being admitted. But in those 72 hours, his widow, Marie Antoinette Evans, shown here ironically on a horse, she felt that she, he got such good care that she, over the next few years, endowed our department with around a million dollars. That endowment now, 110 plus years later, is about $150 million. And her stipulation was that this endowment can only be used for education and research and nothing else. Which means that no matter what's happening financially in our institution, in the city, or across the country, we can always prioritize research and education in our department for both our residents, fellows, as well as our faculty. So that's why we're the Evans Department of Medicine. So we're a fairly large department. We have about 450 faculty. Um, about a quarter of those have PhDs, again, underscoring the research intensity of our department. A little over half our faculty are women. And we have a total between residents and fellows about 230 postgraduate trainees. Our program right now consists of just under 140 residents. Um, we have somewhere between 70 and 80 fellows in the department. About 19% of our residents identify as being from a group underrepresented in medicine, and many of them have advanced degrees, master's or PhD degrees. A little bit now about the leadership of our program. So I went to medical school in Philadelphia and did residency chief residency, an extremely long infectious diseases fellowship at Case Western Reserve University in Ohio. I then joined the faculty there, um, where for the last seven years that I was on the faculty, I was an associate program director. As an APD, I led our international health track, I created a block in clinical skills, and I also fostered an interest in bioethics. Um, I came here in 2011 to be the program director. One of my associate program directors is Craig Narona. Craig is a BU lifer, so he came here in the 90s for undergrad and never left. Stayed for medical school, residency, chief residency, and now almost 15 years on our faculty. Craig does our uh, resident retreats. One of our faculty who focuses on resident development. He also has an interest in IT as well as quality improvement and patient safety, and he runs our quality improvement patient safety pathway in the residency program. Catherine Rich is also a BU Med School grad. She also did residency here in our program in the primary care track. She now leads that track for us. She's also a nationally recognized leader in the Society of General Internal Medicine. James Hudspeth went to medical school at WashU in St. Louis. He then did his residency at Brigham and Women's here in town, joined our faculty uh, around the same time that I did, and is the founding director of our Global Health Equity Pathway, 
He's also our person who oversees inpatient operations. Alex Bachrick is one of our newer associate program directors. Alex went to medical school at Mount Sinai, did her residency also at Brigham and Women's Hospital, joined our faculty a few years ago, and just started this year as an associate program director, and she oversees our ambulatory operations. Finally, Katie Modzaleski. Um, she went to medical college at the New York Medical College, came here to our program for residency, stayed for endocrine fellowship, was an educational leader in the endocrine section for many years, and joined our program this year as associate program director overseeing our recruitment as well as uh, other areas. We also have a bunch of core faculty, some of whom you'll meet on your interview day, and they're all shown here. If you ask our residents what is their favorite part of this program and what brought them here, undoubtedly they will say to you it's our patients. Again, we have the most diverse patient population of any hospital in New England. A third of our patients don't speak English as their primary language, reflecting on the international nature of our population. Many of those folks don't speak any English at all, which means that, believe it or not, we have the most extensive interpreter services of any hospital in the country. You can do global health here without ever leaving Boston Medical Center. There are more cases of tuberculosis diagnosed on our campus in a given year than the rest of the state put together. We routinely see malaria here, we've seen dengue here. Um, when I interviewed for my job now, 11 and a half years ago, they had just seen three cases of scurvy on our campus. You can literally see anything and everything if you're a resident here. And as I tell our residents and the BU students all the time, you spend three years in this environment interacting with this patient population and I assure you, I can airdrop you anywhere in the world and you have both the knowledge and the cultural humility to be able to connect with anyone you encounter and provide them really great care. I truly believe that. Also, as you see here, about a half of our patients live below the poverty line and we have folks at the other end of the financial spectrum as well. A big emphasis that we have here at Boston Medical Center is on health equity. We have many centers for excellence I'll talk about some of the research centers of excellence later. What you see here is some of the programs that we have specifically meant to address health equity issues for our patients and social determinants of health. It's great to learn about social determinants of health and to talk about it. It's even better to actually be able to do something about it. So you see here some of the things that we have. For example, our preventative food pantry. This is a national model of how to do a food pantry that many other institutions have replicated. We have the medical legal partnership. We have our immigrant refugee health program and many, many others. I'll also mention that we have an executive fellowship in health equity that we just started last year. This is only available to graduates of residency and fellowship programs at Boston Medical Center and has been designed to create the next generation of health equity leaders, something that our residents um, are excited about when they come here. We have the privilege of being associated with VA Boston. We have a separate video on the VA. I encourage you to check that out. Now let's move to research and scholarship. As I mentioned to you, we are a research intensive department of medicine. You can see here that our research programs, both at VU and Boston Medical Center, um, continue to be strong. We have many research centers of excellence some of which I've listed to you here. I'm not gonna go over all of these, but I will highlight a couple of them. You may know that the Framingham Heart Study is based not only at Boston University, but actually based within our department. The invest Framingham investigators are largely within the Department of Medicine, and we have a Framingham Heart Study pathway. You'll hear more about our pathways if you see our pathways video. The Framingham Heart Study provides much research experience to those going into cardiology, obviously, but I want to highlight here that we've had folks go into other types of fellowships, for example, gastroenterology, using Framingham data to do research in that field. So what I show you here is not only for the people who are going into those areas, but also for anyone who wants to be able to use those data to do the scholarly work that they wanted to do to get where they want to go. Another example is our amyloidosis center. We have um, one of the very, very few 
amyloidosis centers that actually does stem cell transplantation for people with certain forms of amyloidosis. This results in a rich database that our residents have been able to use to do their scholarly work. Many folks who go into hematology oncology use data and the investigators and mentorship for our, our amyloidosis center. But we've also had folks going into cardiology who have studied the care of cardiac amyloid patients. So again, all kinds of different centers, lots of flexibility in how you can use them. Be sure to ask us when you come about our research opportunities. How do we get people engaged in research and scholarship? Well, this is a timeline that shows you that. Um, we will ask you right after match day if you have specific research interests. Most people don't and that's okay, but if you do, you let us know and we'll start the process of linking you with mentors by the time you come through the door for internal orientation. We also talk about research at our various retreats, at our intern retreat. Um, I meet with every resident one-on-one -on -one early on in the time in the program. One of the things that we talk about, if you wish, is any interest in research and it's my job and it's the job of our associate program directors to link you with research mentors. We also talk about it again in the second year. Research is not a requirement in this program, but I find that more and more of our residents seem to be engaging in research and scholarship. At the end of residency, we have Senior Resident Academic Day. This is a really exciting day where we celebrate all the scholarship for all of our senior residents, whether it be traditional research, basic translational or clinical research, or educational projects, case reports, quality improvement projects, etc. It's a really fun day and one of the ways that we celebrate research that our residents do. Other opportunities they have to showcase their research are both local, regional, and national. So most residents who conduct research present nationally, and most of them end up with publications by the time they graduate residency. We do have, besides Senior Resident Academic Day, another event in our department called Evans Days, which is a department-wide celebration of research. So this is not just residents, but fellows and students and postdocs and faculty, all of whom present their research. And we just had our Evans Days recently, and once again, one of our residents, going up against all these other folks, got one of the research awards just to show you that you can be really productive here doing research. There are many ways to get engaged in research during residency. We have our primer program. Please check out our materials online to learn more about our primer program. This is our NIH supported research and residency program, which uh, also gives us a research chief resident. We discuss research at noon conferences. One of the really innovative conferences that we have is our research in progress conference. This is where residents present to their peers and some selected faculty projects that maybe aren't in the uh, data analysis phase, but maybe much earlier. They present their hypotheses, they present their goals, their aims, and their methods, and they get feedback on this from faculty, but often, most valuably, from their peers. Okay, now let's move on to talking about general wellness, mentorship, advising, and other types of support and guidance that we provide as a program. Um, one thing that's very important to me and near and dear to my heart is well-being, not just my well-being, but the well-being of those I work with, those I train, um, and, and obviously my loved ones. So to me, wellness falls into two buckets. One is the things that we do for ourselves to maintain our own well-being, but really that's only half. The other bucket that this falls into is we live and work in a society in the United States that's designed to promote burnout in, among healthcare workers and it does it really well. So the other part of addressing wellness to me is being part of the solution and working to change the system that we all work in. So let me first tell you about our wellness committee. We have the wellness committee is one of our many resident led committees, more on that a little bit later. Um, this committee does a whole bunch of things related to resident well-being. They send out weekly announcements. They organize weekly gatherings, the wellness nights that we have on Thursday nights in this program. Um, if there are new things, exciting things happening on campus or in the city, the wellness committee will let you know. They also do some curricular things for us. Every December, we dedicate our academic half days to wellness topics, and the wellness committee runs that curriculum. 
they do that in conjunction with faculty, including myself. Um, I'm also the primary faculty advisor to the wellness committee. So I cannot emphasize enough that resident well-being is incredibly important to us. We also do something called Winter Fun Fest. Um, that's uh, something that we have in January, February, March each year. Again, lots of or events organized by our program uh, specifically focused on resident well-being. One of the things that I like to do for my own well-being is running. I do not run fast, but I run long distances for a long time. I often run races that are put on by the Boston Athletic Association, the 5K, the 10K, and the half. And when I run the 10K every summer, I actually challenge residents to beat me. And any resident who beats me, I buy them a drink of their choice. So the first year I did this, nine residents ran with me and I beat five of them. The next year, 12 residents ran with me and I beat all but 11 of them. Um, so, and we'll see what happens. So if you run the 10K against me, I'm happy to buy you a drink of your choice con on the condition that you beat me. So this is what I do for my well-being. I do it with my daughter, I do it with my residents. If you're not a runner, that's totally okay. We have a hiking group and we have a biking group and we have residents who play soccer, residents who play tennis. I think physical well-being is incredibly important and there's some way and you'll find some partners here if you come here um, in addressing your own physical well-being. Mental well-being also critically important. One of the things I'm really proud of that Boston Medical Center did this past year was not only as we have in years past given every single incoming resident or fellow a primary care appointment, but we also for, as a pilot study, um, gave incoming interns the option of having a mental health appointment with a mental health professional as well. We really want to destigmatize taking care of your mental health, and this is something that I anticipate will expand in the future. So, well being, big deal here in our program. I now want to introduce you to our Director of Resident Development, Dr. Asher Telsky. So, Dr. Telsky was a former program director, did that for a number of years. Then he was an associate program director at the University of Pittsburgh, which he did for even longer. And then he came to us in our department about seven years ago in this role of director of resident development. So what does that mean? I will tell you, most programs don't have someone in that role. What Dr. Telsky does for us is a, is a couple different things. A small part of what he does is if there's any resident at any time struggling in one area, for example, they want to improve their in-training exam scores and they scored lower than they wanted to. Well, Dr. Telsky is the person who works with them, creates a, a plan for them to improve, and then tracks their improvement and coaches them along the way. It turns out most residents are doing quite well and they're not struggling. So the bigger part of what Dr. Telsky does is run our coaching program. So this is our good to great program. We have a bunch of faculty who for many years now have served as coaches. Every incoming intern is assigned a coach. That coach is not me, it's not one of our associate program directors, it's not anyone who has any say over your progression through the program, but they are faculty who've been trained in coaching techniques and they serve as a sounding board for our interns as they navigate through that very challenging intern year and beyond. So if you feel like you wanna to talk to someone about getting more organized on the wards, talk to your coach. They're ready to discuss that with you over a cup of coffee. If you want to think about your own career development in other ways, your coach is available to you. If you have something outside of work that you're struggling with, sometimes your coach can be helpful for that too. So the bigger part of what Dr. Telsky does is to run our coaching program. Along the lines of career development, we do have some other programmatic activities. Um, we have advising. Everyone is assigned an associate program director as their advisor when they come in. It's the advisor's job to link you with mentors. It's my job to do that as well. And then we have our resident retreats, which are really a huge uh, gem that we have in our program. Every class gets to go to a class-specific retreat. The other two classes will cover them. Every member of the class goes. Each retreat has a different theme. The intern retreat is probably the most extensive of these. It's a two-day affair. Interns get covered for two solid days. They go away an hour from here, stay in cabins in the woods. The faculty also go and we stay in a hotel while they're in the cabins. But they um, do a lot of bonding, team building, and learn things like feedback techniques, um, teaching, uh, 
start talking about research and things like that. It's really an emphasis on getting away, hanging out with your peers after a couple of hard months on the wards, ICUs, and clinics here, and it's a wildly popular affair. We also have a retreat uh, for our PGY2s where they talk about transitioning to a team leader and really growing as a teacher, and again, growing as a, as a scholar in whatever ways uh, is of interest to the residents. And then we have our PGY3 retreat, usually in late October, early November, and that is really a look ahead to the future. And what does the future hold and how do you succeed after your training is over, whether it be financial planning, whether it be how do you apply for jobs, how do you market for yourself, etc. So these retreats, again, wildly popular. I hope you talk to our residents about them. Uh, I think that they're a particularly exciting part of our program. The last thing I want to dwell on a little bit is this issue that I mentioned at the very beginning, which is resident engagement. This is truly a program where I want people to come and think about how they can leave it a little bit better than how they found it. And there's many ways to do that. So all of our residents are members of a union, the Committee of Interns and Residents. This is the largest resident union in the country. I think this union is terrific. It does all the things that you would expect a union to do. It represents our residents in negotiating contracts, negotiates other benefits for them. But they also do some interesting things that you wouldn't expect a union to do. For example, for many years, they have sent our residents to the IHI meeting if they have QI projects that they want to present. The union also gets our residents onto hospital level committees, including at the very highest levels. So many of our residents are active in our union. All of our residents are automatically members of our union. And usually the local leader of the union is from the internal medicine residency program here. Quality improvement, as our, uh, some of our resident alumni remind me all the time, quality improvement is actually a great way to be engaged and a great way to address systemic issues. And then finally, within our department and within our program, we have multiple resident-led committees, which I've shown you here. I'm not gonna go through all of these committees. I've already mentioned the wellness committee to you. Um, you can see that there's committees that for pretty much anyone who's interested in these things. One that I will highlight to you is a committee that's focused on ambulatory operations. This is called Team ROSC, or Residents of Shapiro and Crosstown. This is where we have our primary care clinics for those residents who have their primary care continuity clinics on campus here. And what I've shown you here is some things that our residents have done that were focused not only on improving the experience for our patients, but also for our residents in clinic. And some of these may sound boring to you. For example, medical assistant huddles, but it turns out that that small intervention that came entirely from our residents who met with the leadership of the clinic and made sure these huddles happened has transformed their relationship with the staff in the clinic. And it again, has transformed the patient experience as well. So this is a way in which residents can be involved in their own training, in their own lives, and better things for themselves and those around them. So lots of opportunities to get engaged with our committees. Please do ask our residents about all of these things when you have a chance to speak with them. All right, now I'm gonna turn it over to our chief residents, and they're gonna to talk to you a little bit about our clinical training and about our conferences. Thanks, Gopal. My name's Emily Mann. I'm Sebastian Suarez. And we're two of the BMC chiefs. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the clinical training at BMC. So at BMC, we use a three plus one rotation format, which uh, we think is probably one of the best uh, things in our schedule. Uh, the three means that you're doing an inpatient rotation or an elective night float and jeopardy. Uh, and in your plus one, it's always your ambulatory week where you're doing clinic. And it's great because it's protected time. You're only focusing on your clinic patients, not worrying about inpatient, um, pay, inpatient patients or vice versa. Um, there are a lot of electives that you can do at BMC. Uh, the most popular ones I would say are the addiction medicine service, uh, which trains you quite well in patients with uh, substance use disorder. Uh, we also have a procedure elective that's very popular among the second and third years run, doing all your procedures. And we also have the ultrasound elective where we trained how to do POCUS. Uh, and just so we all know, we never have 24 hour call ever, which is great. Uh, we have a Jeopardy system, so you're not on call when you're in your inpatient rotations because we use a night flow system. So that's something that's um, quite positive and helps a lot with wellness in our residents. 
For inpatient rotations, we rotate both at BMC and the West Rocks VA. At BMC, we have four general medicine teams. We have subspecialty teams that serve as your primary team, and those include cardiology, GRE, hemonc, renal, and ID. And we also have the ICU um, rotation with three ICU teams and one CCU. Whereas at the West Rocks VA, we have five general medicine teams, uh, cardiology subspecialty teams where you rotate through the CCU as well, and one ICU team. Uh, as I just mentioned before, we have a night load system. That's pretty great because we don't have to do call otherwise. And interns usually do one or two weeks in a year of night load, and that's it. And then we also do a lot of teaching and learning on the wards, um, either actively during rounds with your attendings, um, or uh, we have morning report first thing in the morning for our residents. It's protected learning time for residents. It runs from 7 to 8 a.m. normally. Residents are invited to teach during those sessions as well as chief residents and other faculty members. Um, and then we have noon conference every day. Um, there is lunch Monday through Thursday, uh, which is really nice. And um, we have residents, faculty members, uh, other, sub other subspecialty members um, come and speak to us during those conferences. And also uh, M&Ms, C-Rexes, um, and a variety of other themed noon conferences happen during that time from 12 to 1. Um, and then there's protective learning time for interns on Fridays and on Tuesdays at lunch. Um, Fridays is actually a separate conference in the afternoon. And so um, a lot of the interns really love that. It just gives them the ability to have one-on-one -on -one time with our chief residents uh, and other faculty and with each other. Um, we also do, residents are able to help participate in teaching during fun sessions like our beast mode, that's what we call it, and it's bite-sized teaching, and it's 15-minute presentations approximately uh, that our residents are able to sign up to do about different specialty topics. Now we're going to move on to our ambulatory chief, Emily. Thanks, guys. Uh, hi, my name's Emily Jones. I'm the ambulatory chief for this academic year. And I'd love to tell you about our outpatient rotations and ambulatory time. Um, so as Sebastian mentioned, we have a three plus one system and the plus one is our clinic time um, in which residents can, uh, will see their own continuity clinic patients and have time in ambulatory clinics in various subspecialties. Um, so on the screen, you can see a sample ambulatory week schedule. Um, you'll have four half days of your own continuity clinic where you see your own primary care patients and uh, four, three or four half days of a subspecialty clinic where you rotate with subspecialists so you can see what medicine looks like in that outpatient setting. Residents do continuity clinics at various sites. Um, the majority of our residents have their primary care sites on the BMC campus at our Crosstown location. Um, but we also have a subset of residents who have primary care at the VA in West Roxbury. And there are also four community health centers that are affiliated with BMC throughout the city. And um, many residents choose to do their primary care there as well. Because of our three plus one schedule, Residents are organized into four pods, so there are residents rotating through their clinic in every week. Every Friday morning, with your pod, you will go to academic half day. So this is where you and your pod will come together and learn about ambulatory topics, such as injecting insulin, diabetes management, um, and also other topics such as professionalism, communication skills, career development. Um, this is a, a really wonderful space for a protected learning. Um, and finally, every ambulatory week you have a half day of admin time in which you can catch up on clinic notes, call patients, or um, use it for your own wellness, whatever that means for you. Back to you, Gopal. Okay, thanks Chiefs. Now we're going to talk a little bit at the very end here about career development. Thanks for sticking around with me. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is pathways versus tracks. So my definition is a track is something that you match into. So we have our categorical track, we have our primary care track, and we have our AVIM research track. These are things that you can match into. 
We also have a prelim track. I hope I haven't inspired any of you to choose that track today. So I'm really gonna focus on the pathways that are available in the other tracks. So what is a pathway? A pathway is something that you choose to be in and apply to be in after you've matched here. And you can be in a pathway whether you're a categorical or a primary care resident. So I've shown you the pathways here. We have six of them currently. Um, everyone does the same intern year. You apply halfway through intern year to be in our pathways, and then you find out which pathway you got into, usually by the end of January, and then starting July of your PGY2 year, you formally do pathway activities. Although to be honest, most interns already get engaged in the pathways when they're, once they're accepted. We have pathway leaders. Please be sure to check out our pathway videos for more detailed information. But the pathway leaders are dedicated to making sure that each resident in each pathway has the experience that they want to build their career in that pathway area. And I want to emphasize that these pathways are not for people who just want to dabble in these experiences. These pathways are for people who want careers in these areas. So you can do a global health elective whether you're in a pathway or not. Most of our residents choose to be in some sort of pathway, some don't. Anyone can do a global health experience. But if you want a career in global health, then the global health uh, pathway may be the one for you. Same thing with our medical educator pathway. Everyone will get some experience teaching, whether they want it or not. You'll be teaching medical students when you're here. But if you want a career as an educator and you know that as an intern, well then the med-ed pathway might be for you. So again, please check out that video. Each pathway had these five core components, clinical experiences, non-clinical immersion experiences, didactics, a mentored scholarly project, and being plugged into the bigger network of people in that area, whether it be here regionally or nationally. Each of these pathways has these components, each implements these components differently, um, and you'll hear more about that in the pathways video. Okay, thanks for sticking around to the very end. Um, please be sure to check out our primary care track video if that's of interest to you. Um, one of the crown jewels of our program is our primary care track. We have one of the longest existing primary care programs in the country going back almost five decades now. So please do check out that video and get to know more about that track if you think that might be the right choice for you. Otherwise, thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you on your interview day.